the nurses over here. Amen. Good morning to you. Good to see you here this morning. What an amazing, amazing day it is in God's house. So let's stand together as we get to worship and praise the living name of Jesus. Hallelujah to his name. Yeah. 
next to you and say, I'm so glad I get to be in church with you today. Good you Good morning, good morning. I am Pastor Katie, one of the pastors here at Northside Church, and we are so glad that you have joined us in worship and in praise this morning, um, a time where we get to corporately come together and hear from the Lord. And it's such an amazing time when you have spent time in the Word and listening to His voice throughout the week, so that when we come together, it's a time of celebration. It's a time to celebrate all that God is doing in our lives. So we want to talk about some things that are going on in the life of Northside Church um, this coming week. Starting with this evening, we have Elevate Leadership Training. Um, tonight at 6 p.m. there will be child care provided. So if you are a leader, if you're on one of our councils or you teach Sunday school or you help with children or that you're on our welcome committee or an usher, we invite you to come and be a part of this time of equipping where we get to come together as a core group of leaders and um, hear what God is doing. Uh, Sunday, May 7th, um, we have an amazing opportunity to celebrate pastors in our community. And so Scott and First Lady Jacqueline Evans, their uh, anniversary service is that Sunday, May 7th. And we encourage you that if you feel led to go, you should go be a part of that. Um, there will be some things after their service as well. We're not canceling things here at Northside um, because God has things happening here. Um, but if you feel like you want to be a part of that, we encourage that. Um, Pastor Aaron and I will be leaving immediately following service that day to go up and join in on the celebration um, because God's doing some great things at Live Oak and the connections. Um, I'm so thankful for the connection that we've made with Pastor Scott and Jacqueline, um, Aaron and I, so we will be on our way after service here um, to help with that celebration. But that is Sunday, May 7th. Oh, yes, and if you'd like to give a monetary gift to celebrate the pastors there, um, please see Pastor Marilyn. She would be happy to take that from you. Okay? Sunday, May 14th, we have an amazing opportunity to dedicate children. And we call it a child dedication because in the pa in our past years of ministry, um, Aaron and I have had the wonderful opportunity to not just dedicate babies but to dedicate children, sometimes 12 years old, because that family has come to know the Lord at a later time in their life. And what the thing that I love most about child dedication is it's not really about the child. It's about the parents. It's about the parents saying yes to what God is asking of them as they've received a gift of a child in their lives. And it's about them saying yes to what, how God would have them raise that child in their home, in the community of blessing that they're a part of, um, education, pointing them into a loving relationship with Jesus Christ as their Savior. So I love child dedication because I love partnering with those parents and those families to say, it's time for you to say yes time for you to say yes to what God is doing um, within your family. So that will be Sunday, May 14th. That's also Mother's Day, so it will be a wonderful time of celebration in that service. We are having a baptismal service on Sunday, May 21st, and um, if you are thinking about baptism for yourself, um, just a little bit of a, a witness, a testimony. I grew up in a in Wesleyan Methodist Church until I was 15 years old. And their belief is that children are baptized when they're first born, right? So I was sprinkled. And um, it wasn't until my early 20s that even though I was saved when I was 12, the Lord, I, I, there was like this sense of pride in me, like, well, I was already baptized, right? I don't need to do that again. And the Lord, the Holy Spirit just started shifting some of my own perspective, some of my own perceptions of what baptism truly was all about. And baptism is an opportunity for us as believers to share with our community, this is what God has done in my life. And I want to share that with all of you witnessing that today. And so baptism is to be 
biblical should happen after you've been saved by the Lord, after you, you have accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. It's not going to keep you from going to heaven if you never choose to do that. But it is an opportunity. It is an opportunity to share with your community. I love the Lord. This is what he has done for me. This is how he's changed me. This is how he's transformed me. And I want to share that with everyone who's witnessing that today. And so if you are thinking about baptism, we are on your page. And we want to encourage you in that. Okay. And so baptism will take place on Sunday, May 21st. We will have a class explaining all of that. Um, on the Wednesday night before, which is Wednesday, May 18th at 7 p.m. And we will start that class. It'll be about a 40-minute time together with Pastor Aaron and I. And um, it'll be, it will be immediately following our time of praise and prayer. The other thing I want to say, because the, this, this question kind of came up this past Wednesday, is in the Church of God, we don't believe that there's a specific age of accountability, right? We, we are, who is it for us to say, oh, you're five, you can't get saved yet. If that small person is hearing from the Lord, then we want to encourage them to continue hearing from the Lord. So there, there's no specific age limit on when baptism can happen for you or for your child. So if you have more questions about that, um, that class might be helpful for you on uh, Wednesday, or yeah, Wednesday, May 18th at 7 p.m., immediately following praise and prayer. Okay, so if our ushers will come forward, we are going to take a time of giving back to the Lord just a small portion of how he has blessed us. Um, you know, tithe is out of obedience. Offering is above and beyond that. So what is it that you have to offer the Lord this morning? It may be your monetary tithe, which, you know, biblically that says 10%. But Aaron and I believe that when we call it an offering, that goes above and beyond, right? Because there's blessing that comes out of obedience. So let's pray and ask God to bless what we are giving back to him. Father, we are so thankful for who you are. We're thankful for your Holy Spirit, how it guides us and directs us and, and speaks to us. And so God, we want our minds and our hearts to be open to receive from you. And in this moment, Father, this extension of worship, we want to give back just a small portion of how you have blessed us, blessed us as a congregation, blessed us as individuals and as families. So God, I pray that you will take what is given back and you will um, just take it to the next level. We are so thankful for the way that you bless us. And so Lord, in this time of worship, we just want to be open and obedient to you. We love you, Jesus. It's your precious name. stand together this morning as we just continue to worship and praise Him. Yes. 
are so worthy. You can be at a loss for words. And the things that we get to experience in your presence is, is so small in comparison to what it will be like when we get to worship you face to face. You say you are worthy of it all, and it is from you that we receive all things. So we want to turn around and give that back to you. What great words, what great reminders for us this morning. And Father, as we come to a time in our worship where we get to dive into your word and to hear from you, I think, Father, I thank you for those opportunities that we get to hear from you and from your voice. And so, God, we pray for our pastor. We pray for clarity and boldness and confidence that comes from you and your word, that it will penetrate our hearts and get into those places that maybe those places that we don't want other people to see, but you see them because you want us to be free. You want us to walk in the light. And so God, I know that you have something for us today. Father, help our ears to be attuned to that. Help our hearts and our minds to be open to embracing that. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time to come together as a community of blessing. You love your church. You love your church from the moment that it began until, until it won't be any longer on this earth. You love your church, you love your bride. So Father, we love you this morning. We praise you, we worship you, and we're ready to hear from you. Speak to us, Jesus. Turn your name and, and in all of these things that we ask for you to bless our time together. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. I want to invite all of our <coughs> friends that are fifth grade and under, if you want to be here, make your way out. You can do that. I promise parents they'll be back. If you are fifth grade and under, you are dismissed. Let's go and hear about Jesus that loves you. I need to have a snack. So. Well, good morning. How are you all? Good Man, good to see you all. Glad you're here. If this is your very first time here at Northside, we, we say welcome. Glad you are here. I'm going to say it. I know it sounds redundant, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to say it again. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Because he's still alive and well today, right? Just as he was last week. And I know we celebrated Resurrection Sunday last week, but he didn't stop then. I mean, he's, he's been alive and well all week, and hopefully you have seen that. And so I'm so glad that you... Are here this morning. I um, I'm excited that we're going to be starting a new series, and just I've been processing this. Um, I wanted to teach this for many many months, but God said you're not going to teach that because you haven't even lived it yet. Amen. You okay? So this has been stirring and boiling and brewing for about four months now, but I'm so excited um, that we get to be here in the house of the Lord, and so. Um, yeah, there you go. If you have your Bible with you, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians. That is in the New Testament right after the great book of Romans. But 1 Corinthians, if you don't have a Bible with you, there may be one in the, the chair in front of you, underneath the chair in front of you. Um, but if all else fails, you can see it off the big screen that is located right above my head. Um, but 1 Corinthians chapter 1, um, I'm excited and I'm going to say this, but I think for the next 10 weeks we're going to be walking through the book of 1 Corinthians. The only reason I say I think is because God may say we're going to go longer than that. I don't know. We want to follow his spirit. And um, so there we go. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Are you ready? Are you excited? Are you glad to be in God's house this morning? He is alive and well. And wow. He is, just as that song said, worthy to be praised. 
So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to begin in verse 1. Here we go. So Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, here it is, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4 goes on to say, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, I love verse 9. God is faithful, Amen. who has called you into his fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it cannot return void. And so these next few moments, Holy Spirit, saturates us with your presence here this morning. We give you the room. And God, we know you've got great and exciting things for us to learn more about you. We trust you, Jesus. In your name we ask these things. Amen and amen. I, what an amazing, amazing passage there in 1 Corinthians. Um, I know sometimes that the Corinthian church kind of gets a bad rap because, you know, it kind of looks like Paul, after this section, I mean, you would never say, you know, that, that was a very encouraging section of scripture that we just read, but after this, it's kind of like Paul is just, for the next 15 chapters, pointing his finger at the Corinthians. And that's not the case at all. That's not the case at all. But I love how Paul... Um, begins this letter to the Corinthians. And, and there are just some things um, that I want you to hear. Maybe you take notes. If you don't take notes, I would steal somebody's pen or a piece of paper from somebody else next to you because this is um, just going to be some great, great stuff. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. I love that. He immediately, he immediately identifies himself as who he is. Watch this. And whose he is. Amen. So... Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. That's who he is. Praise God, hallelujah to his name. Paul, by the will of God, whose he is. Whose he is. As we're, call, as we're, we're talking this morning and, just, and sharing together, I want you to, if you are a believer in Christ, I want you to be able to put yourself and your name in some of these names that are here. So, um, even at the beginning of this letter, Paul is letting the Corinthians know Watch this. Paul is letting the Northsiders know <laughs> that Jesus will be the center of everything. Amen. So much so, but look at this, and you can count them later, but I promise you there. Eight times, eight times Paul uses the name Jesus in those nine verses. Eight times. Do you think he's trying to say something? Do you think he's trying to say something? Amen. Paul is being very clear who the conductor for this symphony is of the Corinthian church was going to be, and it was going to be Judas, Jesus. Notice I said symphony and not a train wreck, because I know sometimes we think, golly, those Corinthian people, if they would just get it together, I am sure that Paul is looking down from heaven and saying, if those people from Jacksonville would just get it together. <laughs> I, uh, Pastor Katie and I were able to go this weekend to hear our daughter sing um, in a choir concert. She is uh, at, at, in choir at the college that she's attend, attending. We know her um, professor or the conductor that was conducting um, the concert uh, very, very well. And as I, was, as I was watching him and then reflecting back, I know I was, I was listening to our daughter sing, but at the same time, 1 Corinthians was overwhelming my soul. And so I'm thinking, what in the world? They sang this requ requiem from Dan Forrest. The very first song of this requiem was 40 minutes long. I'm thinking, I can't, I mean, they didn't take a breath, I'm just kidding, for 40 minutes, they didn't take a breath, um, but it was amazing, and they, they were in this, this amazing Catholic church, and the thing I was, I was so struck about is, um, Professor Hofstrom, which is, again, a great friend of ours, he was standing um, very close to us, uh, kind of like right there, right in front of him was a very, very small chamber orchestra, there was a violin, there was a cello, there was a guy playing a flute, there was a guy that was playing an oboe who was absolutely smashing it. And then there was a French horn guy. 
off the distance, there was a percussionist who was playing timpani and all kinds of stuff, and there was a piano player right here. And then I'm not kidding you, probably from me, no, it was further than that, wow. Probably from me to the coffee pots in the fellowship hall was the organist. I mean, that's how far away he was. I know somebody would say, well, that's not that big of a deal. But it is a big deal because every single one of them were highly focused on Dana, Dr. Hofstrom, uh, the conductor there. Why? Because here's the interesting thing. Each one of them had a part. The vocalists, they had their part. The oboe player had his part. The, the violin player had their part. The timpani guy, the organ guy, all that kind of stuff. They were all just looking at a part. But this is where 1 Corinthians began to hit me, and this is where I'm getting to where, where Paul is talking about Jesus, 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 all throughout these first nine verses. The conductor, Dr. Hofstrom, was standing there with the full score in front of him. And you say, well, duh, he's the conductor. Oh, yeah. But here's the thing. He was cueing, and he was cutting off parts at different places. Why? Because he had the whole thing in front of him. He could see everything. These individuals were only seeing a piece or a part. Paul is saying to the Corinthians, Jesus, boys and girls, is going to be the subject in this matter. Not what you think, not how spiritual you think you are, not how gifted you are from a spiritual gifts concept. Jesus is going to be the center of this. You see, Paul knew that these Corinthian people, they were holy. He says it in verse 2, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, and called to be his holy people. He knew they were holy people. So if you're looking for a title for a message today, here it is. Called to be holy. Called to be holy. Now, before we get into this holy thing, I, I want you to look at uh, something again. I just read it to you. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, this is verse 2, and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and our God. The word church in the Greek language, means a called out people. Isn't that interesting? Each church has a geographical address. So we see it in here. To the church of God in Corinth. So there's their address. That's where the mail comes to, the church of God in Corinth. But then they also had a spiritual address, and I love this. In Christ Jesus. So if we take that model and apply it to here, what is today? April 16, 2023, I say this to you. To the church of God in Jacksonville, in Christ Jesus. Doesn't that just have a different tone and a different ring to it? Wow, that's who we are. Yeah, we're in Jacksonville, but in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul is saying to us. So, this leads us to our first thought here this morning. We are set apart by God. We are set apart by God. The the definition of the word holy is that right there. Set apart. Set apart. So the church, according to Paul and even today, is made up of saints because he calls them those. People who have been sanctified and are set apart by God. I love what one commentator said. He said, a saint is not a dead person who has been honored by men because of his or her holy life. I, I thought... I knew that, but I'm thinking, I didn't know that. But I did know that. Paul wrote to living saints, us. We are living. The last, last time I checked, we are all living saints. Hallelujah to his name. Paul wrote to living saints, people who through faith in Jesus Christ had been set apart for God's use. In other words, every true believer is a saint because every true believer has been set apart by God and for God. Now, Here's the kicker, and I didn't even put this in my notes. Don't get arrogant with that comment. I'm a saint. Okay. Live like Jesus. There's the kicker to that. Live like Jesus. So, saints, that's who we are in Christ. That should bring a, a, a peace, a comfort to your soul, a joy to your soul, as we are to know that. When, when a man and a woman date, court, however old you want to call that, whatever it is, um, 
And they pledge their love to one another in holy matrimony. They are set apart for each other. And listen to this. And any other relationship outside of marriage is sinful. Okay, thank you. I got one amen. Glory to God. I, I, I was excited about that. But So we are set apart for Him and for Him alone, meaning Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And the cool thing about this is we're also set apart for a greater family, as it says in verse 2, with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I heard it said that last Sunday, uh, which was Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, uh, is what we know it as, there were two billion people that celebrated Easter Sunday morning. Two billion with a B. That's a lot of people. I think, I think if the if the if the count is accurate, I think there are about almost eight billion with a B billion people on our earth. So that means that there's six billion that Went to Cracker Girl. I don't know where they went, but anyways, that's where they're at. But that's the great thing is we get to join with those who also call Jesus as Christ and Lord. Warren Wearsby, a, a, a very um, pastor to pastor kind of, but a commentator as well, wrote this about this whole relationship with Christ and then our relationship with the church as well as we partner with that. He says this, a defiled, listen to this, this is powerful. A defiled and unfaithful believer not only sins against the Lord, but he also sins against his fellow Christians. Interesting. Why? Because in, in verse 2, Paul says, with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're a part of a family. You, I'm going to make this comment. You are needed here at Northside. Not for what you bring or what you do here, but because of who you are. It, it, and we'll talk about this later in 1 Corinthians, that if you're an eye, then be an eye. Don't yes. wish you were an ear. If you are an ear, don't wish you were, be an ear. Don't wish you were being a, an arm or a hand. Because here's the thing. If you stop being an ear, what happens? We can't hear. If you stop being an eye, what happens? We can't see. If you stop being a hand, what happens? We can't reach out to others. So that's why it's so important. And it's not just about... I'm coming to church at 10.30 on Sunday morning. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. I'm glad you're here. But what part? You play a part in yes. this body. Yes. You play a part in this body. Amen. Paul continues to encourage the Corinthians and us as well by saying, and I love these words, we are enriched by God's grace. We are enriched by God's grace. I know you're like, man, pastor, those are big words. Hang on. That word grace, first of all, if you need help with that, I'm going to unpack that. Grace. Unmerited favor. I'm going to say it like this. Getting the complete opposite of what you rightfully deserve. That's the Easter story. It's the Easter story. We deserve death. And we say it a lot around here. But God. Or you could even say, but Jesus. Came to give life and life to the full. So there's that amazing grace that we sing about sometimes. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a okay person like me. No, what's it say? It says a wrecked person. Partnered with grace is this whole salvation thing. Salvation, again, is another gracious gift from God. But let me also just say this, and we'll unpack this later on, because 1 Corinthians is just so, so very full, and I love it. But there, when you are... When you ask Jesus to come into your heart, there are some spiritual gifts that are given to you. And we'll unpack those things. But that word there, um, enriched, that we see, the Greek word translated, translated for enriched means a very wealthy person. Which is interesting why Paul says to these amazing Corinthian people, um, therefore you do not lack any spiritual gifts as you eagerly wait for the Lord. Is that where it's at? Sorry, verse 5. For in him you have been enriched in every way. Paul is saying to them, y'all are some wealthy people. And not so much from a financial standpoint, but wealthy in, in biblical knowledge. Yes, wealthy in biblical giftings that he's given to us. So you are enriched. Northside Church, I say to us, we are enriched people. Yes, yes. 
We are rich people by the grace of God. Hallelujah to His name. But the Corinthians were especially rich in spiritual gifts. And here's the <clears throat> little bit of a twist, and we'll get to this again later in, in 1 Corinthians. And they knew it. And they knew it. There was a little bit of an arrogance yeah. about them. There was a, we have the gift of whatever this is, and you don't. We have the gift of, and you don't. So there, there's, there's a little bit of... <laughs> Remember the remember the, the, the name that's said in those first nine verses? Do you remember the name? What's the name? Jesus. There was a little bit of Jesus that was being forgotten later on in Corinthians, and we'll unpack that. N.T. Wright, one of the theologians, says this, that they, they were so spiritually gifted that it became somewhat of a problem for them. And again, we'll talk about that later. And uh, the fact that God's called us, he set apart, and N.T. Wright goes on to say this, the fact that God called us, set us apart, and enriched us ought to encourage us to live holy lives. Amen. It's because of what God has done. That's why we're doing what we're doing. Not because of, look at the way that God's blessed me. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? You hear what I'm saying with that? So enriched by God's grace. Enriched by God's grace. At the end of verse 7, there is a phrase I think that we can just kind of blow through. Only because we've read it so many times or we've heard it so many times throughout the Bible and it's just like a, well, duh. But verse 7 says this. It says, therefore, you do not, he's talking to the Corinthians, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you, here it is, as you eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Another way to say, as you expect Jesus to return. I'm going to say this. I, I, I wonder, I, I don't want to cast judgment because I never want to do that. I want to be sensitive to that. But I just wonder how many uh, believers today, they, they, they don't really expect that. It's a good thought. Ah, Jesus said it, but I expect Jesus to return. Come on. We sing about heaven. We sing about going there. The old hymn, I'll fly away, old glory, I'll fly away. If it works out. You know what I'm saying? We don't really, we don't really expect Jesus to return. You know, in Christmas time, we talk about the Advent, but the Christ is coming. What isn't every day Advent? What if Jesus came today? What if he comes tomorrow? What if he comes on Friday at 3 p.m.? I don't know. Hopefully, that wasn't prophetic, but whatever. Um, but am I expecting? Am I expecting? Am I living a holy life expecting Jesus, not hoping? Not thinking he may, it's a possibility. No, expecting that he's going to come. And so therefore my life needs to be an example and a model after that. Of that holy life that we, we talked about. Called to holy living. Paul talks more about this in chapter 15. But as believers expecting Jesus to come. As believers who fix their eyes on Jesus. We want to keep living our lives above reproach. As it says in 1 John 2, 28. Knowing that the King is coming. The King is coming. Brother Ricky on Wednesday night, if you were here, um, he did an amazing job uh, walking us through a, a very familiar passage, but a very powerful passage in John chapter 14, where it says, Jesus is going to prepare a place for us. And, and he, he did an amazing job and linked that, and I just wish you would get excited one time, but anyways... Um, for those of you that know Ricky, he's very animated and he loves Jesus with all that he is. But I love the, the part in, in uh, John 14 where it says, Jesus says these words, they're in red. I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Amen. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah to his Amen. name. Yes. Worthy is his name. That's why we sing those yes. words. Yes. Expect expect Jesus as believers to return. Yes, He's amen. coming back, church. Amen. Yes, he is. And here's the thing. God doesn't lie. That's right. Amen. God is always faithful. Amen. So expect amen. Jesus to return. Last thought. I love this one. Depend on God's faithfulness. Depend on God's faithfulness. You know, we depend, depend on a lot of things in our lives here. I 
I depended on my car to get me here this morning. Um, I depend on my iPhone to work when I pick it up and make a call to someone. Um, I And we all do this. We all depend on one. Yeah, if you don't have an iPhone, you're probably going, should I have an Android? <laughs> but uh, we, we depend on people. We depend on one another for various things. But I'm going to tell you, all of those things are good. All of those things are good. But my car eventually is going to rust out. My phone is going to eventually stop working. As much as we love and care for and are endeared to people, people will fail you. People will fail you. That is why our dependence must be on the faithfulness of God. Amen. He is faithful, which is why we depend on him. Does that make sense? He is faithful. So we depend on him. God was confirmed in them in verse 6. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you, Paul says to the Corinthians. And then, and now it's confirmed to them in the word. Um, Verse 8, he will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the witness of the Spirit within us and the witness of the Word before us, guaranteeing that God will keep His covenant with us and save us to the very end. Amen. Listen to this. this. That's a guarantee. Covenant. God says, I will. Listen. This guarantee, this covenant, is not an excuse for sin. Right. Amen. Rather, it's the basis. It's the basis for a growing relationship of love, trust, and obedience. That's why I put my dependence on God, because He is faithful. Amen. That's why I do that. And I want to do that because that's my obedience part of this relationship that I have with Him. Okay. 1 Corinthians, there's so much. We, by the way, we only covered the first nine verses, so there you go. There's much more in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, but if you want to stay till 3, we can keep going. Um, so here's the application for this morning. I know a lot of times that we have altar calls or, or quiet moments at the end of our service, and uh, if you want to do that this morning, you're more than welcome to, but I want to wrap it up this way, and I want to show you this one. I think... You ushers that are in the room, if you can help me, if need be. Did all of you receive this? Probably, man, that's the biggest bookmark I've ever seen. But did you, all of you receive one of these when you walked in this morning? If not, raise your hand. Do we have some more, Steve? Do we have Frank? Okay. Hey, like 10. Let me yell. I'm going to actually stall for just a minute until he comes back in here, and then we'll go from there. Will you raise your hand if you need one of these bookmarks? Because I want to make sure everybody has one. This is why you get to church early, so you get the free stuff. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. You come before 1025, you get the free stuff. After that, you're on your own. There you go. I want to make sure everybody has this, and we're going to walk this through. Thank you, gentlemen. Our usher team are absolutely amazing. Amazing, amazing people. Steve, there's one on your left. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Brother Joe. So, everybody has one of these infamous bookmarks. <laughs> No, I did not skip dates on here. I did it on purpose. I think it's right. For the next 45 days, there is a 45-day reading plan through 1 Corinthians. Now, if you are already reading through the Word or reading on something else or God is moving you through some things or your journaling time, I applaud you and thank you. If you want to add this to your current, what you're doing, great. Someone may say, Pastor, I'm not going to do that. Okay, well, why is that? Because I don't want to. Well, that's between you and God. But here's the other thing I will say this. 
If you're not doing any Bible reading, I'm not saying this out of arrogance, but my plan is better than yours because you're not doing anything. So here's something. It's very easy. But as you're reading through this word and we're reading through this together as a family, um, wow, here's a thought. Maybe those of you that have children still at home, maybe you want to read through this as your core family as well and say, hey, so what did Jesus, what, what do you think about that? Here's what I want you to do. As you're reading through these, um, these scriptures, it's only Monday through Friday. I know you can do devos on Saturday and Sundays. I get that. Maybe Saturdays and Sundays you want to use that to catch up on if you missed a day during the week or whatever. Or you want to do your own thing, whatever the case may be. But this is Monday through Friday. Between now and June 16th. But here's what I want you to do. I just don't want you to read the simple passage and say, that was nice. I read my Bible this morning and then that's it. Here's what I want you to do. If you have your phone, I am actually letting you, um, I am giving you permission to get your phone out. I want you to answer these questions every single day. And if you want to get your phone out and take a picture of this, you can. Tim, will you throw those questions? And they're very simple. They're very simple. Number one question, out of the verses that you just read for that day, what was your favorite verse or the verses that you read? What were your favorite verses? And write them down. Write that verse or write those verses down. It's very simple. The second question is this, why was that, favorite, why was that your favorite verse? Don't just simply say, I like the word, or because Jesus said it, or whatever. Be specific in why, did, what about that verse, when, it, when you read it, you're like, Oh, wow, that something leapt in your spirit. Why? Why? And then, this is the part that takes a little bit of time. This is why you don't do this while you're driving down the highway. Because, uh, yeah, anyways, you can see why. I want, I'm calling this unhurried time because this is why. What might God be saying to you about what you read today? Okay, you picked your favorite verse. Great, that's wonderful. This is why I thought it was my favorite verse. That's great, that's wonderful. So why, now I need to listen to what God is saying. What might God be saying through his spirit to you about that verse that you just read? And then write it down. Again, it does force you to be a little more unhurried it does force you to say, okay, God, I'm not just going to read something and blow through it and do the check mark because Pastor Aaron put the little check mark back next to it. I want to know what am I reading and why am I reading this and how, Jesus, is it going to apply to me today? And don't be surprised at three in the afternoon when you're dealing with somebody at work or you're dealing with another thing that immediately, and I'm making this up, so don't quote me on this, but immediately, 1 Corinthians 2, 6, or 1 Corinthians 2, Nine comes into your mind from that morning when you read that. And you're going to, oh, that's why I read that, Jesus? <laughs> wow, I never would have seen that. That's why we're asking the question, what might God be saying to you about this scripture? That, in my opinion, is the most important question. Because what happens? Now I have to stop and I have to listen to what God might be saying. It's not just, this is what I think about the scripture. <coughs> But now, God, what are you saying to me about this scripture? And so now I have to stop and I have to listen. Does that make sense? Hopefully, uh, it's not complicated. I don't want to insult your intelligence. But at the same time, I would encourage all of us. And here's the thing. Wow, can you imagine when you walk up to somebody? Because um, here's the thing. Everybody knows it all. But, you know, when I walk up to Brother Joe next Sunday and say, Hey, Joe, so on Thursday when you read whatever it was we read on Thursday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, on 1 Corinthians chapter 2, hey, what did that, what did God say to you about that? Isn't that a remarkable thought? And I love Joe. If you guys haven't met Joe yet, you need to because he's an amazing individual. But we can talk about mowing grass. We can talk about um, well, how his work is doing. He's getting ready to retire. Glory to God. If you don't pray for Joe that he can continue to be strengthened because he's about to retire. Um, but more importantly, I can look at Joe and I can say, hey, so what did God say to you about that whole 1 Corinthians 2 thing? And then there are two brothers 
sharpening one another, as it says in Proverbs. Or I can look at Diane and say, Diane, when you were reading chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, what did that, that verse 6, man, it shattered me. What about you? And then we begin to have a conversation. For those of you that um, live with your, of course you live with your spouse, that's weird anyways, but um, your spouse in, uh, is still living with you, um, ask your spouse maybe that day, what did you think about what you read this morning? What did you think? I struggled with whatever that verse is. Don't forget, just because they're your, they're your spouse, they're still your brother or sister in Christ. They're still one that can sharpen you. I'm going to tell you right now, on numerous occasions, let me just say this, most of the time, the Holy Spirit speaks through a woman sometimes named Katie Ferry <laughs> to me. And so I have the choice of either listening or just saying, man, I did the ant one time, and boy, that was a train wreck. Um, because, because God said, you know what? You asked me to show you something. You asked me to reveal something um, to you. I did it through your wife, because I, um, uh, through my spirit, through her, and then you just blew it off. I said, yes, I did. That was wrong. And I had to confess that to him, and I confessed it to my wife. But there may be something that your spouse says to you. Be sensitive to that. But what is God saying to you about these scriptures? He's alive and well. We all clapped and hooped and hollered about that saying it's Resurrection Sunday, so he's still alive and well. He's still alive and well, and his word is still true. Amen. It's still sharper than any two edged sword. It cannot return void. It is the living word of God Almighty. Stand together this morning. If you are near someone, would you walk over and grab their hand or hold the person's hand next to you? Whether you like them or not, just do it. If you're riding home with them, that's a different story. <laughs> Father, as we are here this morning, as we have exalted and lift high your name, the name of Jesus. Father, together as a family, we are gathered here just as it says in verse 2 with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, we know that the enemy is prowling around, seeking whom may, he may devour. And so, Father, together as a family, we stand united. We stand united on your word. We stand together um, knowing that Jesus Christ is Lord. Father, that you sent your one and only Son, that we may have eternal life. And so that's why we are standing here together. And so, Lord, I pray that as we're holding hands together this morning, that we would be strengthened this week. We would be strengthened. That, God, we would, we would have a... Wow, we'd have that as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you attitude this week, God. We're yearning after the things of you, God. We just can't get enough of what your word is saying to us. And so, God, we, we stand united. God, maybe if we, if we know the person that's standing on our right and our left, that we will encourage them this week through a text or through a phone call or, or even through a visit. God, but we want to be united in your word. God, may we wake up earlier, maybe for those of us that do the, uh, the unhurried uh, devotional time with you, God, at night, that we would, we would stay awake and we would be uh, sensitive to those moments and we would listen to your spirit. God, I pray that we wouldn't just... Check a box on the page because the pastor asked us to. But Jesus, we would really seek after the things that you have for us. Because, oh God, you've got great things in store for us. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. We give you all glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name. And all the saints said, Amen. 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 Hey, there's just a couple things real quick before you leave. Don't, don't leave. Don't even move. I, I know that there are probably some family members that aren't here just know that some family went to uh, Live Oak to be with Brother Ricky. He was preaching there this week, and so we were praying for him. I sent him a text this morning, and uh, he's excited. But I will also